program support provided by the F. Price Kosman Memorial Trust, Interest Bank Trustee, bringing you the Kansas Wild Edge segments on Positively Kansas. It's time for Positively Kansas. Coming up, she was born more than a century ago and died in 1985, but this Wichita-born actress is a bigger star now than ever. Discover what makes her so interesting and learn about the chaotic life she lived in Kansas. Also, we'll take you to a very special place that transforms the lives of Kansans with autism. It's helping them find a future of self-sufficiency and fulfillment. Plus, get on board the garden train. We'll venture into the world of outdoor model railroading. See how this Newton man makes his little choo-choos part of his backyard landscaping. And see what these high school seniors did on their last day of school to commemorate their many years of friendship. We'll have that story from the little town of Protection, Kansas. I'm Sierra Scott. We're so glad you're here. A half hour of information and inspiration starts right now on Positively Kansas. She's once again a movie star more than 30 years after her death. A new film about the teenage years of one of the biggest stars to ever come out of Wichita is creating quite a buzz in the entertainment world. Her name was Louise Brooks, a Hollywood vamp who lived in Kansas during two different periods of her life and then vowed never to return. Jim Grayway shows us why people around the world are still so fascinated with the life of this silent film diva from the Sunflower State. She has this timeless, enduring universal appeal. She was a, a new type of actor in Hollywood. She didn't come across as a stage actor. Uh, she had what was considered more of a naturalistic uh, presence. Well, Louise Brooks was a notable young lady, famous especially for being one of the sexiest creatures that's ever been filmed, I think. From the mid-1920s to the mid-30s, Wichita's Louise Brooks was one of the great stars of Hollywood. Her classic beauty and natural acting style made her a box office hit, but her independent, nonconformist personality made her a real handful for studio executives. She wrecked her own career and she knew what she was doing it, but she was Louise Brooks. She was not some producer's doll. And if she didn't want to do something, she didn't do it. And if that got her kicked out, well, there's other ways to make a living. After she was ousted from the film biz, Louise returned to Wichita, where she also created plenty of controversy. But let's back up a few years to 1906. Louise Brooks was born in Cherryvale, Kansas, to attorney Leonard Brooks and his wife, Myra. Her mother was the oldest of several siblings, and she ended up basically raising all of her siblings. And when she got married, she pretty much told Leonard that, um, you know, if we have babies, they're, they're going to raise themselves. I don't really want to have anything to do with it because I've done that already. Basically forced to fend for herself, Louise was easy prey for a perverted neighbor. She was uh, molested at a young age. Um, by someone in her hometown of Cherryvale. Louise didn't tell anyone about it until years later and said that assault left her with a scar that never healed. Meanwhile, the Brooks family moved to Wichita when Louise was 14. Living in the big city, that gave her more opportunities to pursue her emerging talent for dance. By her 15th birthday, the young Miss Brooks was wowing patrons of the Wichita art scene. Then she got the attention of the prestigious Denishon Dance Company. Well, there was a representative from the company that came through town, um, I think giving a performance on their own, and her tutor, her teacher at the time, approached this person and said, you, you, ought, to, you ought to see Louise. And when they did, they just swooned and said, you know, come to New York City and, and we'll, we'll make you even better than you already are. I think she was a typical kid in a lot of ways. Uh, but she was kind of also a dance prodigy. And she was ambitious as a kid, dreaming of a life away from Wichita, which I think as a kid, as a teenager, she found 
maybe a little too restrictive. Her parents let the 15-year-old Louise move to New York under the supervision of her dance teacher, Alice Mills. This part of Louise's life is dramatized in the recent movie, The Chaperone, based on a novel by KU professor Laura Moriarty. The year is 1922, it starts in Wichita, that this older chaperone who came of age in 1910 is going um, on a road trip with this young, um, soon to be flapper. Louise's chaperone got her situated, and then the chaperone headed back to Wichita. Louise, meanwhile, became a big hit on the dance stage, but her rebellious attitude and off-screen antics got her fired. She kind of uh, got into trouble just about everywhere she went. She then got a job with the Ziegfeld Follies. And then, after a love affair with Charlie Chaplin, she landed a contract with Paramount Pictures. All this, and she wasn't even 20 years old. On screen, everybody loved her. There's something extra cinematic about Louise Brooks. But after a couple dozen movies, Louise was again kicked to the curb. She never really liked working in the movies very much. Um, and... She didn't have a good relationship with the producers, and it all kind of came to an end. Barely 30 years old and all washed up, Louise's extravagant spending habits had left her broke. She had no alternative but to come back to Wichita. She moved in with her parents and opened a dance studio in the Dockham building here at Douglas and Hillside. I can imagine after uh, the life that she had in the 20s and 30s in Hollywood, in New York City, in Germany, in England. Um, Wichita probably looked really, really provincial to her. And it was, I uh, imagine, with a lot of chagrin that she even came back here in the first place. Turned out a lot of parents in Wichita didn't want their kids to take dance lessons from someone with such a reputation. Well, she was a drinker. And, uh, you know, she liked to party at times. Wichita was um, still pretty um, conservative. Um, they didn't, um, wouldn't tolerate a lot of the um, wild behavior that uh, a person could get away with in New York City. Uh, she was not in any way embarrassed by her private life, which was considered rather remarkable even by the standards of Hollywood much less the standards of Wichita. After her dance studio failed and she got busted by cops for a crime called lewd cohabitation, Louise had had it with Wichita. Before boarding the train back to New York, she vowed to never return. She didn't like Wichita, Wichita didn't like her. Her family, though, never left and by contrast were pillars of the community. Louise's father went on to become Assistant Attorney General of Kansas in 1945. Her brother Ted worked as a reporter for the Wichita Eagle. And his son Daniel recently retired as a Sedgwick County District Court Judge. After more rough years of drinking and working as an escort in New York City, Louise landed in Rochester, New York. There she lived a reclusive life writing essays for film magazines. Louise Brooks died in 1985 at the age of 78. And she had made good on her vow never to return to Wichita. For Positively Kansas, I'm Jim Grayway. Louise vowed to never return to Wichita, but many personal artifacts of hers have. A lifetime collection of Louise Brooks' essays, correspondence, photos, and diaries are available to view at the Wichita State University Library. Adults with autism spectrum disorder face unique challenges daily. Many find that skill sets obtained during their high school days often don't translate well into the workplace. But a one-of-a-kind retail shop is changing that. Anna Spencer takes us to Autism Avenue, where a hands-on work program is creating new pathways to success. 25-year-old Claire Dillard greets customers with a warm hello at this neighborhood gift shop. Home to more than collectibles and trinkets, this unique boutique serves as a training program for young adults with autism spectrum disorder. For Claire, the skills she's developed here have made all the difference. It has definitely changed my life. I have become more independent um, at home and healthier relationships, and then especially at work. 
has grown my confidence in work a lot too. The hands-on work program at Autism Avenue is part of Greater Expectations and seeks to expand options for those living with autism. Claire's mother Jeannie notes the impact the program has had on her daughter. It's interesting. The changes are a little more subtle to a parent, but my mother was recently visiting. She's elderly and she lives in another state, and so she doesn't see Claire often. And this, during this last visit, she said, there's something different about Claire. And I said, what do you mean? She said, she's more confident. She looks me in the eye. She is able to have a conversation, a back and forth, just like a typical person would do. What, what happened? And so I was able to tell her about the program. Autism Avenue helps participants to develop the social and personal skills needed to meet daily challenges. Participants connect one-on-one -on -one with trained staff right at the store and work weekly through a three-step program. During the past four and a half years, Autism Avenue has grown and expanded, meeting needs in the community. You just want to go out and just shout out into the community, we're here, come see us, we can help. It's a team effort. As the shirts say that we have here, it takes a village. The support from the families has been amazing. The clients, um, just how, and I don't get to see the clients on a daily basis or a weekly basis, but as I, when I see them, and I see and hear what's happened in their lives, I know this, this means we are meant to be here. Success stories at Autism Avenue not only include helping young adults transition into the workplace, but also helping them develop skills needed to continue their education. 23-year-old Navarro Orozco is preparing to graduate from Wichita State University and credits the program for helping him achieve his goals. I saw all the, their billboard and assumed that they were like, like searching for, for pe people, like a wanted ad. You know, so I took a chance and asked my mother, mother if I should get a job there. And so I went there and to my surprise, it was more than just a job. It's a program and I taken part of it. I mean, I couldn't say no. It changed my life, literally in many ways I couldn't even imagine. Navarro is working on level three of the program and gaining confidence every day opportunities for Navarro are really, really good, significantly because of this program. Um, this program has done things like resume development, interviewing skills, um, getting the job as well as keeping the job, and my hope for Navarro is that he is going to find somewhere that he can use his computer skills, which he has, significant, and flourish. All agree the program is meeting a big gap in Wichita for transitional training for young adults on the autism spectrum. Through grants, fundraisers, and donations, the Greater Expectations program at Autism Avenue hopes to connect with even more Wichita young adults and their families. For Positively Kansas, I'm Anna Spencer. Those interested in the program provided through Greater Expectations are encouraged to stop by the store. You can also check out Autism Avenue website for a step-by-step -step overview of the training process. Now to a Newton man who's combined his passion for trains, gardening, and models to create something incredible in his own backyard. But as Anthony Powell finds out, what Jerry Barnes has made is more than just something to look at. In many ways, it's a reflection of his life. Welcome to a very unique backyard. A backyard where the sounds of a locomotive blend perfectly with a picturesque garden. A backyard that makes Christmas more festive and winter a bit brighter. The perfect place to take your mind off your troubles any time of year. It just relaxes me. I sort of, you know, get in a, you know, it's almost like mindfulness. When Jerry Barnes and his wife Sylvia moved to their Newton home from Nebraska in April 2018, Jerry went right to work on his garden railroad. The couple had similar displays at their homes in Nebraska, so they knew feeling at home in Kansas depended a lot on getting things going in the backyard as soon as possible. You won't believe what was involved. 
Well, it's 56 tons of dirt. <laughs> 56 tons? Yeah, it's sort of amazing how, you know, they'd dump a big pile of dirt here and then that's, you know, the machine would start putting it in and, you know, pretty soon, <laughs> well, it didn't go up that much. So you, we needed more and more. Being closer to one of their sons and grandkids was the main reason Jerry and Sylvia moved to Newton. And Jerry tells us his son and granddaughter helped him complete the project in about four months. But Jerry says the inspiration for the Garden Railroad really dates back years and in many ways is a chronological reflection of his life. When I was about five or six, I got a Lionel train, you know, like a lot of kids my age did and, uh, you know, played with it a lot. And then even though we moved around a lot, I still had kept the train and kept it going. And just like the Union Pacific locomotive circling the track at his house, Jerry says he often rode the line as a kid and young adult. Jerry used his skills as a former art teacher to recreate other childhood memories, like the A&W root beer stand he hung out at as a high schooler in Cheyenne, Wyoming. We had an A&W on the south side of town and uh, the Owl Inn on the north side of town. So we'd all cruise <laughs> from what, one end to the other, you know, supposedly trying to pick up girls or something, you know. <laughs> And he remembers pumping a lot of gas while working at a Texaco station. Seeing these sights today brings him right back to the carefree teenage days he enjoyed in the 50s and early 60s. But not all of Jerry's memories are pleasant ones. He fought in Vietnam. Despite the pain of war, he remains fiercely patriotic and incorporates that sentiment in his garden railroad by, for example, running this locomotive on special occasions like Memorial and Veterans Day. Maybe just a little release, you know, to, you know, because it wasn't a lot of fun over there. And, you know, it still haunts me, so like most guys. Meanwhile, Jerry says he occasionally gets families from the neighborhood stopping by to check out the sights and sounds. He hopes his creation inspires kids to do some old school type activities. It just seems like they're not into doing much with their hands besides their thumbs. You know, look at, you know, kids used to buy models and put models together. I did that all the time and build things. I really enjoy building things. An enjoyment that has added so much to Jerry's life. And in the case of the Garden Railroad, an enjoyment that has provided a reflection of his life. In Newton, I'm Anthony Powell for Positively Kansas. Jerry is also a proud member of the Wichita Area Garden Railway Society. It's made up of folks like him who've created fabulous garden train displays. Now let's venture into the Kansas outdoors where things always look a little different up close. In this week's Wild Edge Report, Mike Blair focuses his camera on dragonflies and their important role in the Kansas ecosystem. In the heat of summer, you can always count on plenty of bugs. The air is full of flying midges, gnats, and mosquitoes. These can range from minor annoyances to reasons to stay indoors. And if it weren't for nature's predators, it would be even worse. Birds come to mind. Some are fast and agile, able to snatch insects out of the air. Homeowners sometimes put up nest boxes, hoping to attract birds like purple martins that may help control mosquitoes and other unwanted pests. But birds have large energy requirements and they usually prefer meals larger than a gnat-sized snack. So better hunters are needed for small prey. And fortunately, there's a perfect prospect, dragonflies. 
Emerging from their underwater formative life stages, these deft flyers are the falcons of the insect world. They can fly more than 30 miles per hour and maneuver with astonishing skill. Their large compound eyes can see with excellent acuity in all directions at once, allowing them to hunt from perches or on the wing. Their most impressive displays occur in late summer when some dragonfly species hunt in large packs. This may be close to the ground or high above it. At this time of year, tiny insects fill the air, though they are usually invisible to ground observers. The dragonflies course this way and that, picking off victims in abrupt, darting motions. They eat on the wing and they can consume huge numbers of mosquitoes and flying gnats. Occasionally, midge swarms arise over vegetation to provide easy pickings for the dragonflies. With fighter-like attacks, the predators strafe these prey clusters relentlessly, eating huge numbers daily in unchallenged sorties. These feeding frenzies, mostly unnoticed, are fascinating to watch. Be on the lookout for summer dragonflies, air show specialists that keep the tiny flies of the world in check. I'm Mike Blair for Positively Kansas. I am so excited to have this group of ladies from Protection Kansas on the show because they did something just really unique to celebrate the end of their high school career. So first of all, ladies, Welcome, I'm so glad to have you. Thank, thank you. you, glad to be here. Th yeah, <laughs> thank you for taking the time. Um, what's neat, I want you to go around the room and say your name and then maybe what your future plans might be. So we'll just start right now. I'm Allison Dill and I'm going to Kansas State to study animal science. Yay, Ema. <laughs> no cat. I am Addie Moore and I'm going to Wichita State to cheer and major in nursing. Yay, shocks. <laughs> I'm Maddie Martin, and I'm going to K-State to study animal science, too. Yay, two K-Staters, yay! <laughs> <laughs> I'm Aspen Hanks, and I'm going to Wichita State to study nursing. Yay, two shocks, okay. Two shocks, two wildcats. <laughs> and now. I'm Kaylee Martin, and I'm going to Alva to study pre-law, and I'm going to cheer there, too. Oh, my gosh, wow. You guys are all going <laughs> off to great things. Um, first question is, who was the ringleader that got everybody to walk to school? Whose idea was it? Addie, <laughs> I love yeah. it. I, I think it was a cool Wait. idea. Thanks. My <laughs> brother did it um, like a long time ago. He's older now, but he did it. And so freshman year, we kind of just talked about it and wanted it to happen. And then we had forgot about it. And then one night I was thinking about it. It was like Sunday yeah, night. Yeah, it was Sunday night. Yeah, and I was like, oh, my gosh, we're actually graduating. <laughs> so we need to do this. So. Why, why did you do it? What, what did you think? Did it bring you to closer together as friends? Was it a way to say goodbye? What, what did it do for you guys? It kind of was a goodbye almost. Yeah, yeah. it was it, kind of just to make it even more memorable, like our very last day of ever. high school. And it was kind of like a, like we started at the grade school, like we started our walk there and then we went ended at the high school. So it's just kind of a way of saying like from one 
from like the beginning to the end, like this is what we've done. It was, yeah, it's kind of like a walk down memory lane, I guess. Yeah, we, we talked about the past. <laughs> yeah, we laughed a lot and we talked a lot and sang a lot. Yeah. <laughs> there was there was never a moment where it was there was not something happening. Yeah. So was it a happy moment for you? Was it a sad moment for you? Because you guys are talking about the past and you guys are obviously a couple of you going to Wichita State, some of you going to K-State, you know, you're going different directions. Um, is this sad? Is this happy? What was the walk like? It was really happy. It was really it, happy, yeah. yeah. It was very energetic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know how at 3 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now, we were all pretty now what's, excited. Now what's cool yeah. is we actually have a photograph of you guys younger. How long have you known each other? What grade were you in when you guys all became friends? Uh, preschool. The four, of us, the four of us went to preschool together and have been together ever since. And Aspen hopped in last year. <laughs> wow. I think that's so cool. I just love the fact that you guys have stayed friends. What are you going to do? Because again, you guys are going, going off in opposite directions, so a couple of you. Um, what, what are you going to do to kind of keep this friendship together? Maybe just walk to see each other. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you walk to Manhattan, to K-State, I'm all about it. <laughs> I'd love to see that. There are cars, too. Yeah, that was just a warm-up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what time in the morning did you start, and how long did it take you to walk it? 3.01. 3 yeah, well, you know exactly. To 7.35. Oh, my gosh. That is a long walk. And you're saying you guys were not quiet at all during the whole thing? To be quite honest, it did not feel like it a long walk. It, 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 it went really by really did. quickly. We went or we stopped at Allison's house to get breakfast, yeah, which is yes. like, what, three and a half miles in, like, kind of? And her mom said that she could hear us like way away. down. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sure we woke everyone yeah. up yeah. as we walked past. So by the end of that day, were you guys pretty darn tired after having to get up so early? Yeah. I, mentally, I was never tired, but physically, oh. I couldn't keep my eyes open. Our we, bodies hurt yeah, so bad. Some yeah. of us walked with our backpacks on, yeah. too, so that was... Our bad idea. <laughs> no, it's hilarious. We just jump to our stomachs and then to our back. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I think you guys are fantastic. I, you know, I've got friends that I stayed friends with through the years, and I'm 55, and we're still friends. So I hope that you guys, uh, that's what I wish for you. Thank you all for taking time to talk to us, and good job. I, thought, I think that's an awesome way to celebrate. Thank you. <laughs> Well, that's a wrap for this week. Positively Kansas at kpts.org is our email address if you have a story idea. We always need them. Until next time, I'm Sierra Scott. Thanks for watching. Program support provided by the F. Price Cosman Memorial Trust, Entrust Bank Trustee bringing you the Kansas Wild Edge segments on Positively Kansas. Support also comes from viewers like you. Thank you. For a free copy of this program, become a new member of KPTS for a $40 contribution. If you are already a member, just send $25 for shipping and handling. Be sure to include the program's name, date, and time.